Hello and welcome to Horde of Tales. I am Krafu Bernal. My pronouns are he, him. You are, mm, you might be seeing, I am a um, cisgender male bodied figure uh, with white pinky skin tone and brown hair and goatee wearing a white polo shirt today. And hi, yeah, I, you might have seen my face around the channel uh, a lot more lately. I'm one of the new organizers here at Horde of Tales, and I'm very, very, very excited to be able to do the solo play today and to introduce Pathfinder to the Horde of Tales community. As far as I know, I don't think there's been a Pathfinder stream on the Horde of Tales channel just yet, and... I won't call myself the resident expert because I know our friend, the Trindividual, is also a, a Pathfinder GM. But I am happy to be the advocate, the resident advocate for Pathfinder Starfinder. I believe a lot in what the company Paizo has sought to do over the last few years. It, you know, fair warning, like their history is just as problematic as a lot of the D20 D&D &D history is. But uh, I fully appreciate the steps they've made in combating that. If you care about politics in your TTRPGs, which actually you probably fucking should. On that great note, we are here to play the Pathfinder solo adventure from the Pathfinder 2E beginner's box. Now, in the beginner's box, there are several different handbooks and some cool maps and I think tokens as well. Uh, mine's all digital, so it doesn't really matter as much. But in the hero's handbook, which is a specific handout for players to learn about the rules of playing a player character, of creating a character, at the beginning of the hero's handbook, there is a solo adventure called the Pirate King's Plunder. And that is what we are here to play today. Um, it, fair, I, I've, I've looked at like the, the beginning of it. I, I don't know the full extent of it, so we'll be exploring and discovering it together. And yeah, we'll see. It, I think it plays a lot more like a choose your own adventure. There's a lot of like skipping around, which I also don't understand. In a choose your own adventure book on the first page, why are you making me go to like page 24? Just let me turn the page if that's the next part of the adventure. Anyway, you'll see more of that today. I thought about creating my own character for this and using their stats, but there are stats provided by the, the, the adventure, uh, and so I don't really want to mess with it. I want to play with it rules as. <laughs> yes, a hot takes talk show in the pan in chat says, hot takes, that, very good, very clever. I love that. And. Real quick, looking at the cover of the Hero's Handbook, we see some beautiful art featuring, I want to point out, the Pathfinder Iconics. So if you Google Pathfinder Ic Iconics, you will learn about the iconic character. I don't know why there's air quotes around that, but it feels like there should be air quotes around it. For each character class. So here, for example, we can see the iconic, uh, the iconic rogue on the right, the... Uh, elven woman with the white hair and the sort of red armor. She is the rogue Mereziel, a forlorn elf. Here we have the human fighter, the iconic fighter, Valoros, who recently found out he was based on the fighter from the Willow movie, which kind of looks just like him if you Google it. And then we have the iconic cleric, Kira, a cleric of Saren Ray. Um, and actually, another fun note about why Pathfinder and Paizo are great Kira, the cleric, and Mauriziel, the rogue, are canonically married. Uh, so the queer representation is there from the beginning. Um, and in second edition, they have really made steps and taken strides towards hiring cultural consultants, hiring uh, contractors from diverse backgrounds. Paizo is the first unionized TTRPG company. And... Yes, like I said, early Pathfinder 1E, first edition stuff, can be super cringe and very problematic. They have acknowledged that 
and moved away from it or are trying to move away from it. And honestly, that is commendable. And of course, there are many other TTRPGs out there that don't have that history that you can and should play. But uh, I love to role play and I love to... That, that crunchy tactical combat just gets me, it scratches an itch in my brain that will never cease. Um, and Pathfinder does it way better than D&D. Hot take, sorry, hot take. Anyway, let's get started because I have um, some great dice that I want to use. And yeah, I've been itching to play this all week. Speaking of dice, I will be using my very special artisanal dice um, in a wormwood case uh, that I bought at a PAX Unplugged convention a long time ago from a um, specialty dice company that has fallen out of favor or has been canceled for making dice out of Nazi tanks. We'll forget that part for now because these are fully copper dice. I'll just show off my dice for a minute. Yes, they are copper dice. They were told, when I bought them, I was told that I can also use them as whiskey stones, although I should avoid using the D4 as a whiskey stone because, um, obvious reasons, this is sharp as hell. Uh, but yes, I don't often get to use these. They're very heavy. I don't know if you can hear, if you can hear as it hits the, 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 the my wooden dice tray, oh, which is see-through because it's green underneath um but yes they are very very heavy and honestly when i'm a player or a gm i like to have multiple dice sets on hand um and these don't work they don't play play well with other dice they're very heavy dice to individual yes and i love them i love them i have not cleansed them yet so all of this patina that you might see i don't know if you can you can see any of the patina on here um, patina, patina, patina. Um, that's all literally my blood, sweat, and tears have gone into this dice. And, you know, maybe one day I'll cleanse them in a nice bath of Coca Cola, but that day has not yet come. Um, so these are the dice I'm going to be using. I don't have a, like I said, I don't have a character that I have come up with for this game. Um, so for now, I think our character will be... I mean, I could go the isekai route and just put myself in there. Yeah, but I kind of like the idea of them being amorphous or formless at the beginning. And as we move through, perhaps chat will grant me some ideas about this character. Or maybe we'll just we'll learn about this character as we go. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> Pirate King's Plunder. You are a wandering adventurer visiting Otari, a small town on the coast of the Starstone Isle, an enormous island magically raised out of the ocean by an ancient god. Otari is renowned for its lumber and fine wooden boats, but that's not what brought you here. You came looking for adventure. Okay, so right off the bat, we know that we are a wandering adventure. Maybe we're from the Starstone Isle. There are several villages and towns laid out around there. Specifically, Otari is near Absalom, the center of the world, as it were. It, and it, Otari is, if, you, if you, you're just getting into Pathfinder, you will hear this name over and over and over again. For a second edition, they've set out to make Otari very much the... The, the, the base setting for beginners. So the beginner's box takes place in Otari. That's why this here, this the solo play is here. And the adventure out of the beginner's box takes place in Otari. From there, the you can pick up Troubles in Otari, a Pathfinder module, which uh, stays in Otari and picks up after the beginner box. So it's a perfect runway for you and your group if you're new to Pathfinder 2nd Edition to just go in and if you want to keep going with the same characters or new characters and you can stay in Otari and continue to build that 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 lore, your, your, your canon as it were. 
Um, in first edition, you might recognize the name Sandpoint. They very much did the same thing with a town um, n north of this location. Uh, but yes, if you ever have any concerns about Pathfinder, you can go to the Pathfinder wiki and there's lots of, lots of lore for you to deep dive into. So yes, we are in Otari, and word has it that a vicious beast is preying upon the town's livestock, and the mayor has offered ten gold coins to any hero who can put an end to the menace. That kind of money would pay your expenses for a month! If that sounds like a lot, ten gold a month, really? One of the things that happened when moving from first edition to second edition was the change of the currency. So they pulled back in order to make silver more important. Whereas in D&D and Pathfinder First Edition, sort of gold was your primary coin. In Second Edition, it's much more likely to be silver. Uh, a first level character starts with 15 gold pieces, which does not get you very far. Let's, let me say that much. If you're setting up and like stocking yourself with equipment and whatnot, it does not get you very far. So 10 gold coins, considering I'm already equipped with stuff, that will help pay for maybe a healing potion or two. Who knows? After asking around at a nearby tavern called the Crow's Casks, you learn that most of the attacks occur on the west side of town, not far from the shore. That seems like the best place to start your search. You gather up your belongings and make your way out along the rocky beach to begin your hunt. It doesn't take long for you to find the entrance to a dark and mysterious cave. Large paw prints lead to and from the gloomy opening. Go to entry number 13. Again, we're on the first entry. You're not, I'm not making any decisions. Why are you making me go to entry 13? Why not just have the next scene be on entry number two? A, a complaint, but oh well. I don't, I, you know, I'm not a choose your own adventure expert. So we're gonna scroll down to entry 13, where we can see some nice art. Noticing the tracks leading to the cave, you hide in the nearby underbrush, hoping to ambush whatever foul beast lives here. After just a few minutes, you hear the sounds of something approaching, and the scent of wet fur hangs heavy in the air. Emerging from the bushes is a lean, mangy wolf carrying the body of a dead chicken in its maw. It appears to be returning home after its most recent hunt. Clearly, this is the beast that's been preying upon the farmer's animals. You wait until it is near, then draw your short sword and spring out to attack. Okay, so we know something else about my character. They are carrying a short sword, which does not give me fighter vibes. Hmm, I don't know what class we have, but it's probably closer to... I mean, it could be fighter, but short sword? Anyway. We're now in combat with a wolf! You know that this feral beast cannot be tamed and must be slain to keep the farmer's livestock safe. Oh. Both you and the wolf take turns attacking one another. We attack by rolling the 20-sided die, or D20 for short and adding your attack bonus, which represents your skill at wielding a weapon. If the total is equal to or greater than the wolf's armor class, AC for short, then the attack is a hit and deals damage. I love that these are bolded. Subtract the damage from the wolf's hit points, or HP for short. To defeat the wolf, you must reduce the wolf to zero HP or less. On the wolf's turn, it will attack you. You'll roll a d20 for the wolf, add its attack bonus, and compare the result to your AC. If the wolf reduces you to zero AC, HP or less, you die. Record both your HP and the wolf's HP on a piece of scratch paper. Pulling out some scratch paper. Meow. Okay. Let's see, it says right here, I've got 18 AC and I have 20 hit points. HP, me, 20. HP, wolf, 15. The wolf only has a 14 AC. If you're familiar with D&D or Pathfinder First Edition, none of this is news. All of these words are the same, are not paid, are not owned by the by, by Wizards of the Coast, as far as I know. There are some words that will be changed in the new remaster of the second edition, but I don't think any of these terms are going to be changed. 
As you might know, combat occurs in rounds. In each round, both you and the wolf take turns, and on each turn, you can use three actions. Three actions. That is different. In Pathfinder 2nd Edition, each character gets three actions in combat. Uh, they stride forward, strike something, and then maybe strike again, or maybe try to intimidate, demoralize, maybe try to raise a shield to defend themselves. Maybe they take a step back, not provoking an attack of opportunity, but, you know, making some space between them. In this case, uh, I think we're just going to be striking. We do have... Uh, I take it back. I'd tell a lie. We have options for actions here. As I said, strike with your short sword. We'll roll a d20 and add seven. That's a very nice attack bonus. If you use this action a second time, you only add two to the roll. And if you use it a third time, you subtract three from the roll instead. This is called the multi-attack penalty. Um, and so each time you attack in one turn, uh, each attack is potentially weaker than the, the last. It has a lower chance of hitting. We can also hide in the bushes, which increases our AC to 20 until the start of our next turn. Interesting. Uh, that is not rules as written, but it does show us the... It's a, a nice way of showing the array of options we have. Um, let me write down my AC, 18. My attack is plus 7. Plus 7, plus 2, minus 3. Because I want to remember first attack, second attack, third attack. And then... Attack bonuses and damage rolls on scratch paper. What do I roll for damage? Yeah, if the result is higher, you hit and deal 1d6 plus 4. Cool. Damage. The wolf gets an attack. Uh, rolls d20, of course, and adds 5 for the first attack. Nothing to the second attack and subtracts 5. So the wolf, too, has a multi-attack penalty. Finally, this is a really cool aspect of Pathfinder 2nd Edition. If your attack roll exceeds your enemy's AC by 10 or more, it's a critical hit. You don't need a natural 20 to crit in this game. You, natural 20 is also crit. But instead, you should think of it, a natural 20 enhances the result of the die to its next level. So... For example, if, an, if I have a plus 7 to my attack, and the enemy has a 28 on it, I don't know if that would crit. It must. It must. I might actually have to look that up. Anyway, you, you crit when you score 10 over. The same goes with skills and with saves. With skills and saves, if you get 10 under, you critically fail. And with an attack roll, none of that matters. So... I get to go first. If you find that the wolf is hitting you too much, you should remember to hide with your third action to make it harder for the wolf to hit you. That sounds great. Of course I would hide. I'm getting very roguey vibes, although I have no, no sneak attack. Well, maybe this is like a level zero rogue. Someone who likes to hide. We're going to start off. This wolf has seen, has, has come around the corner and I'm hiding in the bushes already. Sword in my sheath. And as it approaches, I draw it and jump out in the same time. The wolf hears perhaps the, the, the metal on the sheath before I even spring out. And so it's not surprised. I don't know what to do. Have I ever fought a wolf before? Yes. Yes. Let's say I've fought wolves before, actually. So somewhere in my background, I needed to, to survive, or perhaps I worked on a farm and there were wolves attacking my chickens. So this, this wolf with a chicken, a dead chicken in its mouth, it's really getting me. It's, it's taking me back. It's making me think about my family. And so I strike. That is a, ooh, 15 on the die. So that's definitely going to hit for a 21, 5, 6, 7, 20, uh, 22, actually. That's definitely going to hit. So let's roll some damage. 1d6 plus 4. 4 plus 8 is... Uh, 4 plus 4 is 8 points of damage. At 15 HP, the wolf is already down to 9 hit points left. I have a second action. I'm going to strike again. This time I only get to add a plus 2 to the attack. 
Uh, that's seven. So on a nine, I'm definitely not going to strike. Um, that first short sword attack. Short swords are piercing, I think. Um, I, I stab forward and manage to get it in the chest nice and, and deep. And I, as I pull it out and go to stab again, the wolf manages to jump out of the way. At this point, I think... No, I'm, I'm eager. I, I don't want to hide. I want to strike again. I've drawn blood. And th that memory of the wolf from the, the farm, from my, my youth, has sort of pulled me back. For this one, I do a minus three. And that's a number seven. Uh, uh, that's a seven again. So not going to happen. Uh, three actions. I've struck I've str struck each three times. Yep, excuse me. I've struck it or attempted to strike three times. And now my turn is over. The wolf now gets three actions. Uh, I think because of the rules we saw in here, all the wolf does is try to bite. So we roll a d20 and add five for the first one. Do, do, do. Oh, that's a natural two. Ain't no way that's going to hit me with my 18 AC. I feel like I'm fairly dexterous. I mean, although if I'm adding plus four to this attack, I must must have some strength as well. It must be the armor that I'm wearing in addition to my dexterity. Second bite comes down. It's a 15. The wolf adds nothing to the second attack. So 15 still doesn't hit me. Maybe his jaw scrapes up against my armor um, and I, 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 I pull back in a little bit of fear. Um, and a 15 on the third one for a minus five is definitely not going to attack. This time I pull my short sword up and I manage to catch it in its mouth before swirling around and striking once more myself. We're looking at a six plus seven is 13 that was very 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 close but that does not hit the wolf's ac uh, unfortunate because it's it, it's almost i mean it didn't really get me um, but i'm still a little worried i mean having a wolf pouncing at you trying to bite you it, it takes a lot out of you second attack is an 11 plus two again what the hell 13 which isn't going to happen. This time, I will pull back uh, and and go to hide in the bushes as I I take a step back and, and grab the bushes sort of around me, sort of shaking them to try and create some sort of cover from this, this mangy wolf's jaw. Who goes to strike me? We're looking at a 20 AC. It's going to be tough for it. On um, a uh, 6 plus 5... An 11, not going to happen. A 4 is not going to work. And a 10, a 15 minus 5 is 10, not going to happen. Great. I jump out of the bushes. Come on, let's do this. 6 plus 7, didn't I just... That's a 13. I literally... Uh, I think something's wrong with these dice. <laughs> there we go. That's a, a 13... Plus two is 15. That's going to hit. Only got nine hit, uh, hit points left. Can I take this wolf down on the second strike? It's possible. But it is not going to happen. That's a six in total, which means it only has three hit points left. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for the third attack. It's sometimes referred to as crit fishing, where it's like, I know that with my, my minus three, my potential to hit, is going to be a lot more difficult, but if I can get a 20, if I can get that 20, I can crit and I can hit and I can do something. Natural one. Natural one. Uh, I, I, as I, I, I try to swing, I fall back and before I know it, the wolf is on me. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna lower my AC for this and, and make it a little bit more dramatic. I've, I've fallen on my butt. My AC goes down by two to six, 16. Cause why not? Um, a Six plus five is uh, 11, not gonna work. An eight, not gonna work. This wolf is rolling like crap, but a 19 minus five is still not gonna hit. I got that good, good AC. I jump up off the ground once more, swinging with, with, with uh, uh, emotion, fervor, what have you. The first swing misses. 8, 9, 10, for an 11. 
but I don't care. I'm that, that something in me has come out. I'm I'm swinging again, but I'm scared. I'm fighting for my life. Uh, a 12 plus 2 is 14. That's gonna hit, and I pray to the gods. Please let me survive this. Max damage, 10 points of damage. He only had three left. The wolf goes down. I catch my breath. And I defeat the wolf. Go to entry number seven. Okay, great. Catching my breath, I look around. I leap aside, avoiding the wolf's snarling jaws and drive my sword deep into its flank. With a yowl, the wretched creature falls into the muck and goes still. I clean off my blade and wander into the cave to make sure that this wolf was the only one. As my eyes adjust to the gloom, I find myself in sm inside a small cavern that was obviously the beast's home. It stinks of wet fur, and there are scraps of rotting meat and bone lying about, evidence of its previous victims. Far more interesting, though, is what I spot at the back of the cave. A crack in the far wall leads into darkness, and just above it, Scratched into stone is a symbol that looks a lot like a treasure chest. As I draw closer, I realize the crack is actually the entrance to an underground tunnel. It might just be the hiding place of some forgotten treasure. If you squeeze through the crack to explore deeper into the cave, go to entry 18. If you turn around and head back to town to collect your riches, go to entry 9. Well, I've killed the beast that has been bothering the town. So that's 10 gold in my pocket. And now the adventurers gamble. Do I want more treasure? Adventurers are greedy. I mean, yes, you do have the occasional lawful good paladin that wants to make the world a better place, but I don't know. Treasure is... I can't help it. I can't help it. And someone took the time to scratch this symbol in here. And I think that makes my character more interested, more curious. The draw of treasure, of course, is appealing. But who marked this? Why? And where are they now? I don't know. Let's go to number 18. We squeeze through the crack. Uh, yeah, as in the pan says, that lawful good paladin needs treasure to fund the new orphanage. So perhaps my character is interested in using the treasure for to, to, to do some good stuff. Perhaps, who knows? Who knows what they want the treasure for? But as I said, I think for me, the real treasure is curiosity. And also, you know, I want to play it through the whole adventure. If we turned around, that would be ending the adventure. Obviously. Okay. Putting aside your fear, you squeeze your way through the crack into the narrow passage beyond, lit only by faint light from above. If the cobwebs and dust are any indication, no one has been down this way for a long time. Up ahead, the passageway widens to form a cave chamber before veering to the left. A curtain of moss grows on the right wall of the small cavern fed by a trickle of water dripping from the cavern ceiling. Something about it looks odd, but I can't quite figure that out without succeeding a perception check. In Pathfinder 2e, your perception indicates how good you are at noticing things. Yeah, if you've played D&D before, you're going to say, no shit. Yes, of course it does. However, one thing, very important thing to notice in Pathfinder 2nd edition is that perception is no longer a skill. It has been removed from the skill list and is something that every character is trained in. Some classes may be experts in it, while others may just be trained, which is the beginning level, or masters or artisans or what have you. There's multiple proficiency levels in second edition. Um, but yes, perception has been sort of removed. Perception also is a is what we use for sense motive or insight in second edition. And it's also what is primarily used for initiative in second edition. So perception has become a much more, I mean, it's always been important, but it's become much more so, sort of crucial to the, the, the system itself. 
So, in order to attempt a perception check, we're going to roll a d20 and add plus 4. Once you've rolled, compare to the DC, which is 15, the difficulty class. <laughs> okay, alright, let's see um, how I do. That is a, a 15 on the die, plus 4 is 19. We succeed at the perception check, go to entry 24. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Looking around, we notice a narrow crack in the wall just above the curtain of moss. Water seems to be dripping out from that crack, and it looks wide enough that we might be able to squeeze inside. What do we do? If we're able to squeeze inside a crack, I think we might be a small person. And if I work on a farm and am afraid of wolves or have had to deal with wolves, which I can understand, I'm and that high AC, I'm harder to hit. I think I'm a halfling. My character is a halfling. Yes, I'm happy with that. Um, and we're going to name them Proudfoot. That is their surname. I don't have a, 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 a first name for them yet, but Proudfoot is a very classic halfling name. They, they might even be a hobbit. You never know. Although, what's the difference? Anyway, if we're going to, we, we want to squeeze into a crack, huh? I mean, water is dripping out. Could be bad. Could be good. I don't know. Should we ignore it? <sighs> this is so hard because if you roll on something and succeed, you want to follow it through. If I roll and fail, okay, whatever. I ignore it. I failed anyway. But if I succeed, uh, I got to go in. I got to go in. I, I can't ignore it. We crawl into the crack. Entry number 12. Scrolling back up. Entry number 12 is here. After brushing aside some of the moss, you find small notches cut into the wall, making it simple to climb up into the crack. <gasps> Someone must have carved these on purpose like a ladder. Squeezing into the crevice, you find a small cramped alcove behind it. It's filled with moss, but you note two things. In the back of the room is an old leather pouch that is split open on one side, spilling a handful of coins across the floor. In addition, set into the floor in the center of the alcove is a stone lever. If you gather up the coins, write on your scratch paper that you have 21 copper and 4 silver. Uh, yes, please. Coins. 21 copper. 4 silver. Very, very nice. Very nice. If you decide to pull the lever... If you ignore the lever, you crawl back out of the alcove and head down the passageway below. Pull the lever, Kronk! Pull the lever! Um, yeah, uh, we're going to name my halfling Yzma. Yzma Proudfoot. She is a... Maybe she's like a, um, an alchemist in training. So, And that's why she wants the, the funds, so she can buy her first like alchemist's kit and get going or maybe she lost it recently was robbed or attacked and you know all the stuff broke i told you it's all coming together it's all coming together and um, so isma gathers up the coins this this halfling woman and she sees a lever she can't help but think of her ex-boyfriend kronk who loved levers and there's you know it's pulling at her heartstrings she grabs the lever and she says pull the lever and she pulls it we're going to go to entry 14 now. You have to pull hard, but the stone lever finally moves. As it slides into place, you can hear a rumbling sound from somewhere nearby. Dust and dirt shake loose from the ceiling until the rumbling finally stops after about a minute. Oh, that's a long rumble. There is a deep click from the lever, and no matter how hard you try, you can't move the lever back to its original position. Right, pulled the lever on your scratch paper. Okay. <laughs> Seems silly, but I will write it down. Pulled the lever. Cool. We've pulled the lever, and with nothing else to do in this alcove, we will crawl back out and head down the passageway below. Go to entry number 10. Hello, Releases Pod. Thank you for joining us. 
uh, I don't know if you've played Pathfinder, but we are playing Pathfinder, and I'm enjoying it. Our character, Yzma Proudfoot, a, a young halfling woman who is trying to raise funds to rebuild her alchemical supplies, has taken on a quest. And we're discovering some cool stuff. Uh, entry number 10. So we're just going to scroll up. I'm going to drink some water, too. Uh-oh, I see a combat ahead of us. Will we ever find the path? Path is endless and always to be found. Number 10. So we've crawled out of the alcove after having pulled the, the lever. Pull the lever! And <clears throat> we climb back down the sort of natural ladder that's been formed in the stone. And we decide in, to head through this passageway you know, coming from the entrance. The passageway winds through ancient rock, but it's clear that someone has made it wider with a pickaxe, although it looks like the work was done many years ago. Perhaps the same people who carved that same treasure chest symbol outside. After squeezing hurriedly through a narrow crevice with the ceiling supported only by a rotting log. Ugh, I don't like that. We find ourselves in a small chamber. Roots grow down from above, breaking through the ceiling and letting in faint, dappling light here and there across the cavern. Opposite the entrance is another corridor, but before you can head down that way, you hear a terrible hissing sound coming from the passageway. Emerging from the darkness is a gigantic snake with terrifying fangs. We're in combat with a snake now. Just as when fighting the wolf, we and the snake will take turns attacking one another. But there are a few new things to pay attention to in this combat. Okay, the snake's AC is 15. That's one higher than the wolf. And their hit points are 8, which is half the hit points of the of the wolf. So it could be, could be easier this time. I'm going to write HP snake on my scratch paper. In this fight, the snake gets to go first. I think I've been surprised by this, but during its first turn, it must spend two of its three actions to close the distance before it can attack. So, I come into this corridor, I'm looking around, a young Yzma Proudfoot, and this hissing sound, she, as her eyes settle on the corridor on the opposite end of this cavern, the light dappling in from the roots piercing the dirt ceiling above, a gigantic snake comes at us. For a halfling, even a small-sized snake. I mean, even for us, a small-sized snake would be gigantic. Uh, imagine it's, like, can raise itself up to be around three feet tall. That's crazy. Um, so, uh, the snake spends two actions. One moves 20 feet. We're going to call this a stride, is what it's referred to. So it strides once, 20 feet forward, strides twice, another 20 feet forward. This is a big chamber. It's at least 40 feet across. And on its third action, will attempt to bite me with its fangs. We're going to roll a d20. Um, this one is adding a lot more to its attacks than the wolf. <sighs> Natural 19 plus 8 is 27. That almost critted on me. My AC is 18. If it had gotten a 28, it would have done double damage on this attack. Yikes. It's only going to deal 1d4 damage, but I might get poisoned. So first off, we start off with two points of damage. I'm at full. I was at full health, I should say. Whenever the snake bites you, it might poison you. This happens as part of the bite, so it doesn't use an action. You must attempt a saving throw. God, I love all these. I, I just love quotes and bolds. Saving throws are special roles to resist things that try to harm or control your character. In D&D, you're used to uh, each ability score having its own save, but in um, third edition and perhaps beyond, I'm not familiar with D&D, which is... But with 3rd edition, which is where Pathfinder draws its roots, there were only three saves. Reflex saving throws are used to dodge a bolt of lightning or a fearsome dragon's fire breath. Specifically AoEs that uses dex. Will saving throws are used to resist spells that try to take over your mind. Uses wisdom. 
and fortitude saving throws are used to fight off poisons and diseases that uses your constitution. So, quick, quick little thing about saves. Saves have the same thing with crit, crit successes and crit fails. If you get 10 above or 10 below, it's worse. So we're going to do a fortitude save every time the snake bites us. Let's start with a d20 and add our fortitude save, which is a plus eight. Very handy. We must be like a, a, a very stout halfling. And that's a natural 19 on the save. So if uh, the result is equal to or greater than 16, you fight it off and nothing happens. Uh, if the result is 15 or lower, you take an additional 1d8. It looks like they're not using crits on the saves here, which is fine. That's just an introduction. Yes, to individual, exactly. I, I I love how everything's bolded, and it's it feels very it feels very sort of friendly to come into. Okay, so we've 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 taken uh, two points of damage from that bite, but we've staved off the poison. Um, on our turn, we can attack. Unfortunately, there's nothing to hide behind in this chamber, so we can't boost our AC. The only actions we have is to attack. Technically, I could stride and step around the room, and if I had if a class with abilities, I, I could use actions for those things. Quick note, you might see this. You see this arrow here under the action? That indicates it is a one action action. If there are more arrows, that means it takes more actions. So one, two, or three. I, I'm sure it'll go over that with us later. Uh, okay, this snake is is has less HP, but is harder to hit. It's more dexterous. So Yzma's standing there, and the snake strides across the room. Slithers. It's weird saying a snake strides and bites her straight in the ankle rude she's gonna take her short sword and stab down at it Ooh, that's a 16 16 plus 7 is 23 uh, which is not a crit uh, but it is definitely a hit so let's start with 1d6 plus 4 come on Ooh, max damage 10 points of damage killed Okay. Oh, Isma. We're uh, hey, I'm feeling pretty lucky. I'm also feeling like I feel like I got to roll Isma up after this, like a, a proper a proper character. Um so yes, uh, the snake had 8 hit points. We did 10 points of damage. <laughs> Stab and look like maybe like a, a piece of snake meat comes out on the end of the short sword as she as she pulls it out. <sighs> Snakey, snake, snake, snake. Perfect. Uh, if you defeat the snake, go to entry eight. If you succumb to the snake and its poison, go to entry number 17. Luckily, we have not succumbed to anything just yet. Um, so having successfully defeated it, let's go to number eight. Hmm. Here we go. <clears throat> With a swish, your blade slices right through the snake and it falls dead at your feet. With a loud thud. Stepping around its body, you check the room for anything of value. Yzma finds a very old, tarnished silver coin wedged between two stones on the floor. Okay, what? A, a, we find a silver coin wedged between two stones on the floor. It must have been here for ages, but it will buy you a night at the inn back in town when this is all over. Add one silver to your scratch paper. I mean, hey. We can add that to the silver we've already found. Leaving the dead serpent behind, you head toward the passageway opposite the entrance. Unlike the caves that came before, this tunnel looks like it was carefully dug out of the earth and meticulously reinforced with wood and stone. Oh, excuse me. After about 20 feet, the passageway forks, heading off to the right and to the left. You can hear the faint sound of splashing water to the right while a very cold breeze drifts out of the passage to the left. Which way do you go? I'm a water sign. I'm a Pisces. I gotta go to the water. I don't know if I like the cold. A cold breeze drifting out of a dark cave. Uh, I'm not sure I'm into that. Um, he's, let's. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm gonna go right. I wanna go right. Although I think there's like a rule for mazes and labyrinths. I mean, you pick a side, you pick right or left, and you always keep that wall to that side. 
So if we turn right, we need to make sure that we're always going right until we can't go right anymore so that we don't get lost. Okay, entry number five. I'm committing, I'm committing. I'm locking my answer in. Entry number five. The burbling sound echoing from somewhere up ahead grows louder with every step until you can hear the sound of rushing water clearly. As you turn a corner, the source of the sound becomes apparent. The chamber up ahead is split in half by a stream that flows to the center of the room. This swift underground river enters the room out from the right and flows out to the left. Across the way, you see a passageway that continues onward and you can just make out a staircase going down. Ugh. Discarded on the ground in front of you is an old torch probably left here by a previous explorer. Uh, yeah, we're going to take the torch. Of course we're going to take the torch. I'm going to write torch on my piece of scratch paper. And if your notes say pulled the lever, go to entry number 16. We pulled the lever, Kronk! And now it's paying off. All right, and uh, number 16. Okay, in the center of the river is a pillar of stone that looks like it's been submerged for a long time. You might be able to use it as a stepping stone to jump across the river. However, you could also try to swim across. Okay, very cool. That lever we pulled raised up this pillar of stone and created a sort of a, brin a bridge for us. Uh, hella, hella smart, y'all. Okay, so for this we need to roll a skill check. To attempt a skill check, of course, we're going to rely on our trusty D20. You might have noticed we use the D20 for a lot of things. It is a D20-based system. And we add the bonus associated with the skill we're trying to use. If the result is equal to or greater from than the DC of the task, you succeed. Uh, again, this, this uh, adventurer is not mentioning sort of the crit successes and all that, but either way, it's all good. Okay, so in this case, we're going to use athletics to either jump across or swim across. If we try to jump, we must succeed at two athletic skill checks in a row, one to jump to the pillar and another to jump to the other side. If you fail either one, you must fall, you fall in and must swim the rest of the way. If you try to swim across, you have to do two athletic skill checks. Um, but yeah, but if you have succeeded at the check to jump before falling in, you only need to do one. Um, okay, the jump DC is 10 and the swim DC is 15. So it's much harder to swim than it is to jump. Uh, and we get a plus seven to athletics. So Isma is actually, she, she's well trained. Um, even though she might be a, an alchemist, an apprentice alchemist, she is, and remember, she, well, that makes sense. She has a, this farming background. So she... Her muscles are, are pretty well developed. Maybe she's even got, like, the makings of a six-pack. All of a sudden, she's wearing midriff armor for no good reason, just because it looks hella cool. Anyway, we got to make sure we don't get swept downstream. And since the river leads deep underground through long tunnels without air, you will drown <laughs> if you fail a total of three athletic skill checks before you succeed and get out of the water. Ah! This could be it for Yzma. We get a plus seven, so the the chance of her failing these jumps is very low. Okay, Yzma, she, she, her short sword is sheathed. She's got that new silver coin in her pocket, so we're up to five silver, and she's going to sort of give herself a running start and jump across. 17 on the die. Easy. She she lands on the, the stone in the middle. Maybe it's a little slick and slippery, like some sort of like moss has grown on it, maybe in the meantime. I don't know if that happens with rivers, underground rivers, but anyway, so it, this one's a little harder. She it's it's she doesn't get that running start like she could before because that the pillar isn't so large. But hey, one more jump, one more successful jump, and we're across. We don't have to worry about this river anymore. Ooh, that was an eight. Okay, an eight plus seven. Easy. Uh, what is that? 15, 16. We're across. I mean, I shouldn't have worried too much, but we've been doing so well that I thought, okay, something bad has got to happen, right? 
We make it to the other side and we make our way downstairs. Go to entry number three. Okay, cool. Entry number three. Yzma travels down quite a distance before arriving in a large and cavernous chamber. A hole in the ceiling above allows a thin shaft of light to come in that illuminates a pile of coins and at least a couple of glittering jewels. Standing in the center of this pile is a wooden statue, crudely carved to look like a pirate. <laughs> the statue holds a wooden saber pointed menacingly in your direction. Drawing closer, you can tell that the statue has joints and hinges on its arm, arms and legs. But by the time you realize that you've drawn too close and the statue comes to life, swinging its saber back and forth, the menacing statue approaches you. As it draws near, you spot a strange looking keyhole located in the middle of the statue's neck. Well, fuck. If you have skeleton key written on your scratch paper, we don't. Should have gone left instead of right, I guess. Uh, so we have no other option but to draw our weapons and attack. We go to entry number 25. Wooden statue with joints, okay, and hinges. We're now in combat with the pirate statue. To start this combat off, you and the statue must start by rolling initiative to determine who gets to act first. We have not yet rolled initiative. This is the first time we're doing it. As I mentioned earlier, initiative is typically a perception check that both of us attempt. Whoever gets higher gets to go first. My perception bonus is a plus four and the statue's is a plus zero. Okay, okay, let's roll. Let's roll, I'm gonna roll with mine. I got a, a 13. Let's see what the pirate statue gets. A seven, so I get to go first. If we go first, we must spend one action to move to the statue before any attacks. The statue is much slower, so if it goes first, it has to go two actions to get up to me. Cool, we're faster than the statue. Uh, the statue's AC is 18, its hit points is 20. Oh, that's a lot. And uh, so it's got starting HP and AC is the same as me. I'm, remember, I'm down to 18 HP from that snake. We get two actions. Strike with your short sword or move. If you move up to it, if you move away, the statue must spend two of its actions on its turn to move up to you before attacking. So we can strike, strike, stride, only allowing the pirate statue one strike per turn. Ugh. Come on. Let's make it let's make it a little harder. Shall we? No, 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 no. I don't want Yzma to die. I'm way too attached to her now. So we go first. We get to Yzma. Um, technically, she needs to draw her weapon. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and stick with that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say she draws her weapon. And as first action, second action moves forward to the statue. And third action will strike it. I don't know how striking a wooden statue with a short sword is, is, is going to work. It's got a high AC, so we'll see if I can if I can get past it. I get a plus seven to this. No, that's a natural three. She her her she's she's too nervous. She swings the sword and doesn't even touch the wooden statue. Hi, Verba Valkea. We're playing Pathfinder. Uh, welcome. And first action, uh, draw. Second action, stride. Third action, strike. Oh, we didn't move back. Oh, okay. The statue gets three attacks on us now. Great, 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 great. Um, the statue has two different types of actions. Strike with the saber or move. You can see the symbol here is updated. This is the symbol that indicates, that represents two actions. So it takes two actions to move. Okay, it gets three attacks on me now. And it gets a plus nine for the first one. <laughs> Well, cripes. Okay. 14 plus 9 is going to hit my AC of 18. Ugh! And it's going to deal 1d8 plus 2 damage. Okay, 1 on the die. 3 points of damage. 17, 16. I'm at 15 now. It has 2 more attacks. It does get the map, though. Multiple attack pirate. Uh, pun points, individual. 
Uh, multiple attack pirate. Okay, so the second one's going to be a plus four. Natural 16 for a dirty 20. That's absolutely going to hit. Oh, no. Yzma, don't die here. Oh, that's a seven on the die. Okay, nine points of damage. Holy crap. I only have six HP left. Third action. A 15 on the die. Minus one is 14. That will not hit. Okay. Okay, Yzma is looking bad. Um, this pirate is striking her with a wooden saber. It's literally just bah, bah, like bashing her with it, essentially. Um, like, like maybe you can see, maybe like her arms are bare. Her midriff and arms are bare. What is she, a barbarian? I don't know. Maybe she had to buy the armor on like on sale or something. It was like a, I don't know, buy half, get half off or something maybe she couldn't afford it all anyway so you can see her arm is like like there's this deep sickening like blue green bruise that's forming from where the, the pirate struck her twice um and she can see the end in front of her and this can't be how it ends so she takes her short sword and she's gonna jab twice at this thing and, and hope and if i mean either way she's gonna run away she, she can't allow it to strike three times and hit her three times so, even one hit might be too many. Uh, okay. Five plus seven is not enough to get past this. Uh, oh no. Oh, uh, this statue is going to defeat me. It's going to defeat me. Second strike. Natural 20. Whoa! Natural 20. Okay. We're going to crit, baby. Uh, max damage. Six plus four is 10 times 2 is 20. Oh, Isma, you lucky, lucky. It's that halfling luck, baby. It's that halfling luck that's coming through. Okay. So she, that first strike, she she, she sort of flails against the, the wooden statue, just sort of banging at it. Um, and then she takes her short sword and, and, I don't know, maybe even like closes her eyes in fear and she drives it forward um, and finds some sort of weak spot in its stomach. Uh, and like there's this cracking wood as she pushes all the way through her short sword, sticking through the other end of this wooden statue where the keyhole is actually she uses her sword instead <sighs> oh my god <laughs> uh with six hit points left she's not feeling great not feeling great but the statue it had 20 hit points that literally uh uh -huh. i love pathfinder let me just say that i will point out in first edition on crits you would double the amount of dice you rolled in second edition, because you are more likely to, you're, you're more, you crit more often, it, you only double the result of the dice. Um, thank you, Pan, for telling me to hydrate. Yes, it is important to hydrate, especially when you're talking to yourself. If you defeat the statue, we defeated it! Go to entry number six. Okay, the Pirate King's plunder is ours! Oh, Yzma's gonna open up her own apothecary. It's gonna be so sick. Okay, the pirate statue falls to the floor in a thunderous crash, breaking into several pieces. With this last guardian defeated, you are free to gather up the loot and make your way back to town. Okay, in total, the pile of coins contains 79 copper, 25 silver, and four gold. Okay. Let me write this down because it's important to me. I know we're about to end, but it's important to me. Okay, I already had 21 copper from before, so that I now have 100 copper, which is one gold, which is one gold, by the way. Right, 10 copper is one silver, 10 silver is one gold. Um, 25 silver, so I now have 30 silver, three gold pieces, uh, and four gold in addition. Okay, dope. For gold, hell yeah. But the real treasure was the friends we made along the way. Hell no. The real treasure was three gems. Two simple agate gemstones worth five gold each. But the last 
sparkling rupee easily sold for 20 gold so let's add that up gems three gems equal to 30 gold pieces <laughs> very rewarding trip indeed gathering up the last of our loot we prepare to head back to otari and claim the reward for killing the wolf and while we're at it we might just spring for the nicest room at the inn and maybe talk to the town blacksmith about getting a new suit of armor yeah this half off stuff is not the best you know but that is a tale for another adventure Congratulations on defeating this solo adventure. Did you collect all the treasure? There's a total of 40 gold worth of coins and treasure you can find during this event, uh, plus the reward. Remember that 10 copper is equal to one silver and 10 silver is equal to one gold. And we're now ready to build our own character. Go to page 12 to begin the journey. Uh -huh. We will not be using the, what is it, page 12. Let's double check what's in here. Um, I absolutely want to build out Yzma as a, a full character now. Um, but just to see what we're doing. Creating our hero. Um, so this the Hero's Handbook uh, helps people, outlines the steps for creating characters and by telling you to create a concept, by telling you about ability modifiers, allowing you to select an ancestry. Uh, another big change I think that was important in the culture of Pathfinder was moving away from the, the term race um, to ancestry. I, I, I suppose species is also applicable. Starfinder has moved away from race to species just because it sounds more sci-fi. But I, I think ancestry sounds nice. It's more wholesome, if that makes sense. It's kind of a weird 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 word to use for it i think but nonetheless here we are um like i said i will not be using the book for creating a character i'm going to be creating this character in hero lab what is hero lab i'm glad you asked krifu hero lab is a um, character manager and creation uh, software developed by w wolf 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 what are they something lone wolf Lone Wolf Development, okay, by Lone Wolf Development, um, it used to be a, a software application, but now the, the, a few years ago they moved to Hero Lab Online so that you could access your, your stuff from any device. Um, I, I pay for the patron level of Hero Lab so that specifically I can have campaigns in which I can invite people to use the content that I purchased on Hero Lab. Um, it makes things a lot a lot easier, I should say. Um, it also is great for managing characters because this will automatically sort of add up the bulk of the equipment that I'm carrying. Um, it'll tell me all of the things that I'm missing uh, from the, the character sheet. Um, so I'm going to do a, a little bit of um, quick stuff on stream, if you don't mind me. I'm going to put this here and do this and then we're gonna just pull that out a little bit there we go there we go yes verba valkea um I'm, I'm 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 glad you found it helpful uh, it's especially for people coming into the system for the first time it can be a little bit daunting um for me when i'm learning a new system i always like to do it by paper uh like back to the pen and paper roots a character when I build my, my first character in a new system. Um, and honestly, I will build multiple. I'll build like a character for every class just so I can really learn the system. Um, but here we are. Okay, so I've opted just to show you the center screen. There are um, two other portions, the, the left and right portion, which shows sort of drop downs and things, but the center part is probably the, the most important for us at the moment. But we're going to start with an ancestry. We've already decided Yzma's ancestry. She is going to be a halfling. Um, actually, hold on. i got to open this up a little bit more. There's more to show you. Ugh, look how long that goes. There we go. To here. And then if I do this. Is this too small for you? It's a little too small. Let's do that. 
and I guess we're not going to show everything. Okay. Um, we've already decided that she's going to be a halfling because we we named her Proudfoot and everything. There are multiple, there are many other ancestries available. Halfling is just one of the, the common ancestries. Um, you'll note under common ancestries, we also don't have half-orc or half-elf. That is because those have moved to heritages. So at the, if you want to play one of those, you have to first select a human ancestry and then select a, the half-orc or half-elf heritage. I think in the remaster, which is happening now, um, half-elf and half-orc can be applied to non-human ancestries as well. Just to, to do that. Um, because half-elf and half-orc kind of come from uh, racist backgrounds. Revea Valkea asks, what's the difference between an ancestry and a heritage? I'm glad you asked that, Revea, Verva Valkea. Uh, the ancestry is the first, is sort of the base template for the character. The heritage is something that comes on afterwards and can change depending on what ancestry you've selected. So in this case, we are going to play a halfling. We've already decided this. So we're adding the halfling ancestry. Then we're going to pick our heritage. What sort of halfling are we? Um, there are gutsy halflings. There are hillock halflings, uh, which we did, we did kind of say that she might be a hobbit. So a hillock halfling kind of makes the most sense. Accustomed to a calm life in the hills, your people find rest and relaxation especially replenishing, particularly when indulging in creature comforts. When you regain hit points overnight, add your level to the hit points regained. When anyone uses the medicine skill to treat your wounds, you can eat a snack to add your level to the hit points you regain from their treatment. Um, yes and no, Verbo Valkea. I think her heritage is also can also be it's not just the cultural influence, it's, it can also be your uh, genetic influence. So, but maybe, I don't, I don't know, because, for example, uh, it, I do, it does, yes, it is your genetic influence. Um, because we have the versatile heritages. You'll note these are all highlighted in blue because they typically, you typically need to check with your GM first before selecting one of those. Um, if you would like to play an Asimar or a Tiefling or a, um, a you know, any, anything uh, sort of that's been plane touched, an Oread, an Ifrit, so, you know, Earth and Fire and those planes, you will select a Heritage. So as a Halfling, I can easily, I can select, I could be a Dampfear, I could be a half vampire Halfling, which is actually kind of dope, I'm kind of into that actually. I won't be selecting a versatile heritage today because I don't think that came up, but there are, th th this is the way to do that. Um, we liked Hillock Halfling for her because we did talk about her potentially being a hobbit. Um, the Gutsy Halfling gets a bonus against emotion effects, so fear. There is the Jinxed Halfling, which requires a GM's permission. Um, you, can, you, can, you can actually jinx people. Well, that's, that doesn't fit Isma. We have the nomadic halfling. We've traveled around, get additional languages. Observant halfling, a bonus to perception. Uh, twilight halfling, we get low light vision. And wildwood halfling, uh, from the deep jungle or forest. Okay, we're gonna stick with the hillock halfling. You get more hit points when snacking and sleeping. Love it, perfect. Um, and in addition to our ancestry and our heritage, we are going to select an Ancestry Feet. Pathfinder 2nd Edition has leaned into the feats. Everything's a feat now, which I love. I'm also going to turn off the warnings and errors for now. Um, so we're going to hide everything that needs validation so that we can keep our, our choices to a minimum. Let's see here. We've got Distracting Shadows. Um, we've learned to remain hidden by using larger folk as a distraction. Interesting. There's a folksy patter. Uh, halflings are, the, the, we are adept at disguising coded messages, folksy idioms. Interesting. I don't know if that's her. We have halfling lore, um, which gives her a proficiency rank, a trained proficiency in acrobatics and stealth. 
Uh, I don't know if that's it either. I feel like luck. We got very lucky in that adventure. Very, very lucky. We were very close to dying. So halfling luck is a fortune effect. You can see right here, the, the, there are traits attached to the feats and things so that you can make sure that they're not, um, that they, they're, they, they're stackable or not stackable or what have you. And happy-go-lucky nature makes it seem like misfortune avoids you. And to that extent, that might even be true. You can re-roll the triggering check, but you must use the new result, even if it's worse than your first roll. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Halfling luck. Isma's a lucky woman. Perfect. Um, and the next step is picking our background. We've already decided that she is uh, potentially a, um, an apprentice alchemist, although we might pick the alchemist class. I don't know. I was kind of going in a different, a few different directions with her class idea. We, we thought rogue at first, and then we were thinking alchemist because I don't know. Why were we thinking alchemist? Um, and then we have a little bit of Barbarian as well. Uh, I'll, I'll be curious to see where we land on her class selection. I would love to have the Lucky Feet IRL in the pan. I would love... I mean, maybe I am lucky and I just don't know it. I don't have access to my character sheet. I can't... I don't know what feats I actually have. But, um, so, in this case, we, we were thinking Farmer, Farmhand or farmsteader uh, farmhand with a strong back and understanding of seasonal cycles you tilled at the land and tended the crops your farm could have been raised by invaders you could have lost the family tying you to the land or you might simply have tired of the drudgery but at some point you became an adventurer and farmsteader you built your house using wood from the trees surrounding it no that's that's not it should we stick with farmer uh, I don't see anything that calls out to me immediately for other options. Scout, I like that. I don't know. I kind of well, well. Let's stick with farmer for now. Um, her, yeah. Of course, she left. She was sick of having to fight wolves all the time. And then, of course, her first adventure. What do you know? She fights a wolf. Um, selecting this background, just to double check, will um, give us two ability boosts, which we're going to come to in a little bit. That is how we determine our ability scores. Because I've selected farmhand, one of the ability boosts must be to constitution or wisdom. Um, I think we'll go with constitution because her wisdom didn't seem, her perception was not very high. We, it also trains us in the athletic skill, which is why she was such a good athlete and the farming lore skill. And we gain the assurance skill feat with athletics. That means with assurance that we can perform athletics even in the worst circumstances. So instead of rolling a skill check, we can instead use assurance to receive a result of 10 plus the proficiency, proficiency bonus. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. She was easily able to hop over those stones and into the river. We're going with farmhand. It makes the most sense. Um, and that's our background. At the moment, uh, we don't ha we can't pick any languages because we haven't selected our intelligence score yet. We do have an option to select home region. And in that regard, um, we did have an option to select ethnicity under ancestry. Uh, we did, we did, we were thinking Halflings from the Verduran Forest, from the Mwangi Expanse, with Othabon um, in Verizia. Interesting. Ah, oh, these are halflings from ancient Thassalon, which has a lot to do with the Pathfinder lore. We, we will not get into it today. Halflings from Murini, just east of Avistan, which is the sort of... Um, Shall we say European continent? Uh, Iobaria. I don't know that that place. Interesting. Okay, so there's like these are like cold, icy winter halflings. We have the Jarek halflings, which are from northern Garant, which is on the southern continent uh, of Garant, where the Mwangi expanse is. So think like this would be like north east or northeast Africa. And then we have Chalaxian, um, which. <sighs> 
a part of the problematic history of Pathfinder. In Cheliax, halflings were, for the longest time, um, primarily slaves in Cheliax. Uh, but again, as Paizo has, has, is taking steps to removing their problematic issues, they've canonically um, f freed the slaves in Cheliax as well as in other lands and have publicly stated that go moving forward in future adventure paths and modules and, and document setting and settings and whatnot um they will not be focusing on slavery it's a i don't know it's a touchy top topic a lot of people don't want to have slavery in their games in my public games i i don't really want to deal with that um capitalism is bad enough indentured servitude we can i think we can start with bad contracts and awful employers for even going that far it's often a veil for me um or a, a, slavery is often a line for me in in public games also as a gm i don't really feel the need or desire to play like a slave owner <sighs> no that's just no fun um i don't think any of these ethnicities apply to our character so we're just going to ignore it for now um we did have the option to pick a home region. We decided that she was from Otari um, and the area of Absalom, which would be this island. Yes, yes. You can see there are a lot of places here, but I think, yeah. Arcadia, so that would be the American continent and Tian Cha is the sort of Asian continent. Um, it, I, it sounds bad to like lump everything together. We have a European continent, an Asian continent, a West, like an American continent, and an African continent. Um, but I, I don't know well, how else would you do it if you're trying to show diversity in your games, especially you know we've seen that the the new Mwangi, I guess it's not a new book anymore. The Mwangi Expanse setting book really opened up um, what. Uh, it was referred to in the past as like sort of the dark continent um, and filled it with life and color and and yeah character uh, which is exactly what it needed so no longer in these adventures are you playing you know these 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 sort of european colonist types who come to uh, the the african continent and have to deal with like savages and whatnot you know you're going to a place that has that has is full of lore and has civilizations that have been there longer than yours, buddy. And I, I think they've—I think that really shows the the way that they are they are trying to improve the product. Um. Anyway, uh, forgive me for that tangent. We're going with Absalom as our home region. Um. Uh, then we've got the profile section. We're gonna name her Isma Proudfoot. I am the player. Um, we are not going to select an alignment in the remaster of Pathfinder 2nd Edition. They are removing alignment as a mechanic. So we're going to pretend it doesn't exist. Um, and then we're going to select our class. This is going to be hard. This is going to be hard. We're not a spellcaster. You can see all the classes that are here. There are a lot of classes. Um, and there are like two more that require validation, Gunslinger and inven uh, Inventor. Uh, we did say, we did kind of want to go with the um, Alchemist vibe. I did land on there some way. Verva Valkea asks, why are they removing alignment? The remaster of second edition is happening because of the, the open game license that Wizards of the Coast tried to mess with at the beginning of 2023. Um, and so Paizo and all of its products are were based on the open gaming license and have decided to remove anything from the game that could be constituted as such, that is related to D&D &D in some way, shape, or form. And that's part of why alignment is being removed. I think also to talk about the problematic history of D&D in games, alignment has often been used as a sort of um, uh, racial signifier. So like goblins and orcs are always evil because they're green skin savages and like, no, 
that's ridiculous. You don't have evil born in your DNA. Uh, and I think Paizo removing alignment from the, the, the conversation will help to fix that. I don't, I, you know, there are a lot of people who still cling to this. Uh, I remember I played one Pathfinder 2e game where we met a warg, so like an intelligent wolf, and I wanted to talk with it and communicate with it, and another player was like, no, wargs are evil. They're evil. Kill it. And it's just like, oh, well, uh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I, I'm not going to play that way. It just, that's silly. I mean, I understand g needing to com go, go into combat when needed, the combats we saw today, there, I had no choice. There was no, con oh, sorry, no conversing with my combatants. Anyway, we got a character to finish building. I feel like, I feel like barbarian. We had a lot of emotion in this, um, and maybe now, uh, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because I did want to go with the alchemist route. I don't want to play an alchemist. That's not her. But maybe investigator? Because investigators can be sort of like mini alchemists. And that might explain why she was doing, why she had a plus four on the attack. Because if she was using like a, um, uh, what's it called? What's it called? Investigators can use their intelligence for attack rolls if they do, if they, if they use the right actions. I feel like that really fits her. I'm gonna go with Investigator for now, and I just wanna double check that I have the option of picking like a forensic medicine as a methodology. No, alchemical sciences, there we go. Your methodology emphasizes chemical and alchemical analysis, collecting info from unusual particles and fluids found on the scene. You possess enough alchemical know-how to whip up a few tinctures to help you with your cases. Hell yeah, Yzma. Okay, this sounds freaking awesome. Uh, she's an alchemical sci scientist, an investigator. Perfect. Um, so as an alchemical scientist, I get crafting formulas. The crafting system in PF2E has, there are, people have their complaints. It's a little complicated. I think all crafting systems are complicated. But you get formulas with which you can make items. Um, so I can make a lot of things uh, in the pen, right? NPC and players can have motivations that are spicy or less than nice, but it's not inherent. Yes, exactly. I don't, I, I will totally play at an evil table or run a whole game, an evil campaign, of course, but we're not saying that anyone is evil because of their DNA. That's, that's also boring. Be evil because you have a traumatic past or are just a selfish prick, but like, let's make it interesting, you know? Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. I can make, oh, there's a lot in here. Oh, yes, yes, I wanna make an alchemist's bomb. I want to make, I want to make, do I want to make drugs? Would Yzma make drugs? Flay leaf, so which is basically marijuana, alcohol, mutagens. She would make a bestial mutagen because it's Yzma. So a bestial mutagen um, allows you to uh, gain an item bonus to athletic checks and unarmed attack rolls. And you gain a claw unarmed attack and jaws. Cool. Yeah. Um, oops, uh, we get two more formulas. I want to take the Elixir of Life, of course. That's a non-magical healing potion. Um, and I think sticking with the animal theme, Eagle Eye Elixir. For the next hour, you gain an item bonus to perception checks that is greater when attempting to find secret doors and traps. So for an hour, you get plus one or plus two to find secret doors and traps. We were really good at finding things. It would make sense that she might have the eagle's eye elixir. Um, so I get those two craft, those four crafting formulas, and I get two alchemical sciences formulas. Uh, these are everything. It's just all of it, which is unfortunate because a lot of these are too strong like a moderate vaccine that's a 
Oh, vaccine's only a level... Aha, a minor vaccine's a level one item. A lesser vaccine's a level three item. No, I'm not making any vaccines. Sorry. Oh, a leaper's elixir. A lesser's a level one, and we'll take that. I want to do jumping. Jumping sounds fun. And we, we, we've kind of seen that she's a jumper from uh, that, that adventure. The Bravo's Brew gives a bonus to courage against fear. We have anti-plague, antidote. We did have to deal with poison. So upon drinking an antidote, you gain an item bonus to fortitude saves against poison for six hours. Yeah, hell yeah, absolutely. Cool. Okay, we're... Um, and then we also get a class feat. Everyone gets class feats, but we can only take from the investigator class feats. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Flexible studies should allow us to take a... Aha! During your daily preparations, you can cram on a certain subject to become temporarily trained in one skill. I don't know. That's odd. Um, it gives us the GM. Makes, it means the GM has to tell you if there's something odd as soon as you enter a new location. Very cool. Very cool. It is a G, sort of a, reliant on the GM, but it is kind of great to walk into a room and go, Hey GM, uh, I have the that's odd feet. Can you tell me what's odd in here? I'm going to go with the trap finder. I want to increase my her, her perception. I want her to be, even though her wisdom's not great, we've decided her wisdom is not going to be super high. Um, I, I feel like after this adventure, she might be like, I need to be more aware of my surroundings. Um, let's go to ability scores. Okay. So as you're building a character, instead of, taking points and applying them to your ability scores you get what are called ability boosts each boost pushes your ability score up by two or pushes the bonus up by one as it were and we can see at first level you get four boosts that you can put into anything my ancestry gives me two automatic boosts one in wisdom and one in dexterity it also gives me a penalty to strength um, I think our, our strength seemed to be pretty decent, so I'm going to go ahead and spend my Ancestry feat, um, as a Ancestry Ability Boost, by negating that strength modifier. I want to be able to carry a lot of more things. Having that minus one strength penalty means my carrying load is a lot lower. Um, and for my background, we also get two Ability Boosts, of which we said need to be in Con or Wisdom. I'm going to put one into Con. <sighs> and the other one in intelligence, because as an investigator, that is my main stat. So I'm going to make sure I'm also boosted in my first level. I'm not going to boost wisdom anymore, because we've already said that. I'm going to boost her charisma. I'm going to boost her con. And I'm going to boost her dex. That sounds about right to me. Um, it looks good. I'm happy with it. Zero plus zero strength plus two dex plus two con plus three int plus one whiz plus one cha. Could be worse. Could be worse. Um, background has become highlighted again. I We are able to get more languages now that we've boosted that intelligence. So we're going to go ahead and take... We have core languages, so dwarven, elvish. And these are only... These are the languages that... Uh, like only halflings can take at level one and because I don't know they they limit you for some reason you could open up everything hide nothing and take you could just take whatever languages you wanted I mean check with your GM of course like if you take uh, all go Golthu, the language of Abeleths, um, you probably want to make sure that that will be used in the adventure that you're playing in or if you take Akatonian, that's a fucking different planet. So make sure that you're <laughs> going to be using that language. Um, I think she's going to take Gnomish. And Goblin. Goblin? Yes. She's going to take Goblin. And then I'm going to take a regional language. And I'm going to take... Aha! Aha! So all of these languages appear in Absalom. Mm, doesn't narrow down things. I'm going to take Kelish. 
Um, the language, a language that appears in Absalom, Katapesh, and Kadira. Uh, yeah, the, the Kelish people. It's a, these are basically other versions of common, specifically. Um, in this world, common is typically Taldane, the language of the the language used by the the land of Taldor, which used to be an empire that sort of um, that that had a let it got spread across this region very strongly, which is why Taldane happens to be the, the common language. Um, let's go to skills. Okay, skills. As an investigator, we are a skill monkey. Um, so we get seven skills that we can train in. Skills are based on your pro pro your proficiency bonus. So if you don't have proficiency bonus, you only add your ability score modifier to it. As a farmhand, we've already trained in athletics, and we're trained in a special skill called farming lore that only we have access to. As an investigator in the alchemical sciences, we are trained automatically in crafting, and society. Okay. Interesting. We get seven skills. I'm gonna take stealth because she was definitely doing some hiding. I'm gonna take medicine and nature because she fought animals and she's an alchemical science scientist. It's important to know medicine. And by the way, you can use medicine to actually heal people and restore hit points to people. A plus four isn't great, but I'll take it. And we have four more that we can use. I'm not gonna pick any of the magics. So arcana, occultism, and religion is out of the question. Nature relates to the primal, the primal school of magic. So she actually, because we've trained in nature, she does understand druidic magics um, to an extent. Maybe she studied it a little bit in her, alche her alchemical studies. Hmm. I'm going to take acrobatics. I've got a good dex and it feels like it's handy to have. I'm also going to take survival, the farmer and nature. It's important she knows about the, the wilds. Two more, six, seven. I feel like thievery is important. We had that lever. She likes levers. She likes sort of um, mechanical stuff. So I'm gonna take thievery for lock picking and whatnot. One more skill. Let's go with a social skill, diplomacy. She's a pretty straightforward person. She's not gonna try to intimidate you, despite her namesake. Um, and she's not gonna lie to you either, despite her namesake. She's she's fairly straightforward. Um, one might, if we were using alignment, I feel like I might go lawful neutral, but we're not using alignment to forget I ever said that. And the only thing left in this character builder is wealth and experience. As I said, the level one character starts with 15 gold pieces, but we get to start with more gold pieces because of the adventure we went on. So, um, <laughs> we got a lot of freaking gold. Um, uh, 30 silver, four gold, plus 10 for the, the reward puts us at that was 14 gold plus the three gems that we sold. So, that's a total of 44 gold pieces plus 30 silver and 100 copper. Oh, 44 gold, 30 silver, and 100 copper. No platinum, unfortunately. Whoa, 44 gold pieces. I'm rich. I am hella rich. Very, very nice. Let's go to Adventuring Gear. I have a formula book. Cool. I'm going to make things easy on myself. And I'm going to grab the Class Kit Investigator. This comes with 10 pieces of chalk. This comes with flint and steel. This comes with 50 feet of rope. One week of rations. Uh, uh, no, actually, two weeks of rations. Five torches. Six, because I picked up that other torch. A water skin, a backpack, a piece of soap, a sap, a short sword, some studded leather, a crossbow, a crowbar, and a bedroll. 
This is gonna cost us 92 silver. We can see in total we have 480 silver um, with all the gold and the copper that we have. Do, 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 do. We bought it. Yeah, baby. Uh, what else did I want? I wanted the alchemist's tools. Uh, this mobile collection of vials and chemicals can be used for simple alchemical tasks. If you wear your alchemist tools, you can draw and replace them as part of the action that uses them. What's an alchemical task? We have the alchemist's lab. Bulk six, but I need it to craft alchemical items during downtime. Okay, well, let's buy the lab. That is a part of why she went adventuring to buy a new lab. So let's make sure she has the tools. Yeah, we're rich. They're gourmet rations. Are they? I, she's not going to lose her head just because we're rich. I think she'll buy the standard rations and then treat herself to a nice meal. Don't forget, she's a hillock halfling. We love to eat. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to buy the alchemist slab. So that's 50 silver. <laughs> Gone. Hey, we still got 300 in silver left. Um, I'm going to... Ooh, there's a detective's kit in here. This leather satchel contains empty vials, a pair of tweezers, a supply of small linen cloths, a set of brass calipers, and knotted string for measuring distances. Um, a detective's kit adds a plus one item bonus for checks to investigate a crime scene or similar. Interesting. I don't, I don't know if she's a detective. I, 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 that's the one thing I don't like about the investigator class is that a lot of people think, oh, you're a detective right away or private investigator or whatever. And it's like, no, 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 no. I may use an investigator's tool set, but I, that does not make me a detective. The last and first investigator I played was a goblin butler in, in a, a, a city, the city of Canabras. And I think I, from, I think it really fit his, his vibe, the investigator and a butler, their perceptive, their... Um, in, in typically intelligent, they, they know things, they know people. Um, I, I felt like that, that combo really worked well together. But yes, no, in, investigators do not need to be detectives. The only other thing I want to buy on here are healer's tools. I am trained in medicine. I can treat wounds and administer first aid and treat disease, treat poison. So even if someone you know goes down i can at the very least stabilize them you need healers tools to be able to stabilize someone with a medicine check you have to have it you don't need to be trained in medicine to administer first aid but you have to have the tools um yes yes so we immediately see i'm overburdened with all of this stuff <laughs> Well, of course, the alchemist, the alchemist's lab is not meant to be mobile, so we're going to move that to elsewhere. It is no longer on my character, takes my bulk down to five. I'm going to equip the backpack, the alchemist's tools, and the healer's tools, make sure I have all of those. And we're going to start moving things into the backpack. The backpack will help um, carry the load a little bit. So. Uh, I'm at five bulk at the moment. Items are anywhere between um, no bulk to light bulk to one bulk or maybe like sort of like half bulk or in this case even point two bulk. Um, if you have like five, I want to say five light bulk items, then it counts as one bulk. Um, and the backpack specifically lets us it holds up to four bulk of items and the first two bulk don't count against my bulk carry perfect so we're gonna move the bedroll into the backpack we're gonna move the crowbar into the backpack the formula book i don't need that on my person the oops the torches are gonna go into the backpack move to backpack backpack my water skin will go in there i don't think this will necessarily the soap will go in there uh, the rope i don't think this will help my bulk too too much because i think the majority of it at this point is coming from my armor and weapons but this should at least 
Probar, Chalk. Okay, cool. And you can see if it's in the backpack, it now has a backpack icon next to the name. Um, again, this might be too granular for some of you. If you don't want to count bulk and your GM isn't making you, you don't have to. But I believe, personally, if you don't count bulk and encumbrance in your games, you are actively nerfing a portion of um, the characters who have high strength scores, and you are buffing the characters with low or even negative strength scores. Just because you dump strength doesn't mean you should be able to carry everything, and I'm not sorry. I fully believe you need to keep track of it. And I think in second edition with the bulk system, it is easier, more easy to handle. So at this point, I'm down to four bulk and I'm no longer encumbered. Uh, it costs, I'm at, at five bulk, I am technically encumbered and that puts restrictions on my, my speed and some of my skill checks, etc. Double checking weapons, I have a short sword, which uh, makes sense. We did have a short sword in the, the game. Um, Hands holding equipment. Oh, uh, so I equipped the healer's tools <laughs> and the alchemist tools, and so now my hands are full of things. Anyway, we'll unequip all of those. I have the short sword. I have a sap, which is non-lethal, and I have a crossbow. Keep in mind these traits here that you can see. The agile trait means that that multiple multiple attack penalty that happens is lessened because it is an agile weapon the short sword is finesse which means i can use my dexterity instead of my strength for the attack roll and it's versatile versatile s which means i can choose to do slashing damage instead of piercing damage very handy um, i will also note the crossbow has the Hmm. Hmm. It doesn't have a weapon trait. Interesting. Because technically you have to spend... Why doesn't it have a... It doesn't... It should have like a weapon... A weapon trait. So that you have to spend an action to reload. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. And I've got armor. Studded leather. Which puts my AC at 17. Technically it should be 18 because of the adventure we did, but whatever. Maybe I bought new armor and that, that made it easier. Um, 25 gold, I can spend a lot of money. There And there's so much to spend money on. Let's look at some magic items. Um, so many consumables. Talismans that you can attach to weapons and armor. Um, held items, bag of holding, of course, would be uh, very nice. Um, f an ever-burning torch. Hell yeah. Let's buy an ever-burning torch. It's always lit. And I can sell those other torches I bought. Perfect. I think that's enough. Um, we want to we wanna make sure we have some money left over. I'm down to 10 gold, which is still a lot, considering... Considering that whole adventure was set up to earn 10 gold, I'm doing pretty well. I'll get five copper back for selling these five torches. Um, yeah, and that's it. My character is done. Uh, I can now go over to the play tab um, to sort of see my character in action. Um, you can see here all the special abilities on the right. Uh, on the right, I can devise a stratagem as an investigator, use my intelligence mod instead of my um, strength or dex mod for the attack. Uh, although, yeah, I have halfling luck, um, lots of other things. Investigators can pursue leads, etc. Um, Hero Lab makes it very easy to handle all of this if I want to subtract hit points or add them if I want to add hero points or spend them. If I want to apply conditions and modifications, that's all here on the right. All my skills are here on the left, as well as my attacks, my ability scores, all my proficiencies. And it's all here and ready for me to use. As an alchemical scientist, I get three 
vials of alchemical science a day to use for the quick tincture action. So specifically, I can brew up a short-lived, I can use my alchemical tools to literally create something um, in one action, six seconds, less than six seconds, which is really cool. So I could make a bomb and then throw it as my second action. And then a third action, make something else. Or, I don't know, run away. Lots of cool things to do. So yes, that is the, that was the, um, oh, I, dang it, dang it. Um, that was the, uh, the, the Pathfinder 2E solo adventure. Um, thank you so much for being here and playing this with me. I had a great time. I hope you had a great time. Um, should we raid? Should we raid? Let's check who's on. We might raid. We might raid. If we if we see someone we know. Ah, Misadventurers League. Yeah, we're, we're absolutely raiding over to them. Give me just a sec. Yes, thank you in the pan, um, Teacher Krifu. I'm, I'm Mr. Krifu is here to help. Like I said, I was very excited to introduce Pathfinder to the Horde of Tales community, and there will be more in the future. Rest assured. Rest assured. Um, do, 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 do. Let me get this raid set up. We are back. On Horde of Tales. In. There's got to be something going on next week. Checking my calendar. Next week. We have. Aha. Okay. So we are back in. Yes. Thank you in the pan. Um, we are back on October 20th. Friday. For another round of the EU Happy Hour. You will see me there. I'll be playing. Um, in a game of. Uh, Final Girl run by G... Well, facilitated by GM Zuki. It is a GM-less game, so all four of us will be playing together and playing the characters um, one by one. But um, yes, so uh, follow us on socials. Join the Discord. Um, and yeah, I, I really hope you enjoyed this. And because I certainly did. It was nice to be able to use my, my copper dice, my heavy, my heavy metal dice um thank you verba valkea for coming here and, and asking questions thank you in the pan to individual uh, rolistas for being here um very very excited and yeah i wish you all a great night and i'll see you next time uh -huh.